Shalom Mingaleva. I'm so happy to see you all again. Uh, as you all know, I've uh, I've missed I've missed you uh, from the for the last two and a half years. It's hard to believe it's been so long, um, but I'm very happy for each opportunity I have to see you and to be able to to uh, to offer something to you, but also just seeing your faces and hearing your voices is a great blessing to me. And I'm particularly uh, pleased and grateful for the opportunity you, you're giving me to, to speak on this uh, very important topic, uh, coping with the current crisis through Christian spirituality. And I don't need to tell you how relevant and important this topic is for Christians today throughout Myanmar and, and among the Burmese diaspora. Uh, though I've not walked in your slippers before uh, in the last two and a half years, uh, the horrors and the violence of the past 18 months have been traumatic and distressing to me. Uh, I've had to learn how to cope better uh, with my own uh, distress and, and trauma and uh, grief over what's been happening and, and fears. And so what I offered you tonight for your benefit has personally been helpful to me in my own experience as well. Topic you already know, we've already talked about that, but let me share with you briefly the outline for this special talk. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about what coping might mean and look like for you. Secondly, why Christian spirituality is relevant in our suffering. And then most of our time will be spent on three important coping strategies. One, lean heavily upon relevant spiritual truths. Two, utilize the most helpful spiritual practices. And three, actively work through your grief. Okay. So first of all, what does coping mean? The first point that I want to emphasize is that in order to cope better with your, your this crisis and what you're going through, you need to come to grips with the nature and the extent of the crisis for you. The current crisis in Myanmar is perhaps the greatest and most far-reaching crisis the Burmese people have ever had to endure since independence from the British. Every Myanmar citizen has been devastated by what has been happening over the last 18 months and over the current state of affairs. People are disappointed, angry, confused, helpless, impatient, and desperate. As one MIT faculty member wrote to me this week, and this is an edited version, he says the current crisis has destroyed our hope, dreams, and future. So how is this crisis affecting you? Since no two individuals are exactly alike, and everyone responds a little differently to a major crisis like this one, how would you describe not the cause of the crisis, but the impact that it's having on you and on those you love and care about. The more you can name how you personally are being affected, I mean, physically, psychologically, socially, emotionally, or spiritually, the better you can identify helpful coping strategies. The better you can name your feelings and identify the kind of support that you need from others, the better they can give it to you. Let me give you some examples. If you know that you're sad or depressed and you can name that, then, then you will know that you probably need some love and encouragement. If, on the other hand, your feelings are volatile and disruptive and you and disruptive to your life and you feel out of control, then you need to search for ways to get better grounded. If you feel lonely or isolated, then reaching out more to, to other people is probably what you need to do. Or if you mostly just need someone to listen to you, to your feelings or to your story, then find a caring, safe person and ask him or her to, to sit with you and listen for a while. This, by the way, is one of the the best things that you can do for each other as MIT faculty members or staff members or fellow students. You, you just get together, not to solve problems, 
but just to listen to one another so that people have a chance to express their feelings and to not feel so alone. And as another example, if you feel abandoned by God, then you might need to try a different spiritual practice or have a talk with a pastor or a spiritually mature friend, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, the first step toward coping better is to identify as specifically as possible how the crisis is negatively affecting you so that you can get a better idea of which direction to go to get the support that you need. The current situation is so horrendous and taxing on everybody's ability to function. Everyone is struggling to cope and everyone needs to work together to support each other in seeking greater strength and stability and ability to, to face the difficulty, but also to work through it and to overcome it. According to the American Psychological Association, coping is the use of cognitive and behavioral strategies to manage the demands of a situation when these are appraised or determined as taxing or exceeding one's resources or to strategies to be used to reduce the negative emotions and conflict caused by stress. Now, I find that de definition maybe a little bit difficult to understand, so I translated it for you this way. Coping well refers to adopting successful strategies that is helpful ways to think and to behave in order to handle the stresses produced by the crisis. So coping then, in other words, is all about finding and utilizing strategies for how you're going to think and how you're going to act that will actually wind up reducing your stress and giving you more life and strength and peace and ultimately joy. So that's what we mean when we talk about coping. Uh, now, what might coping look like? I think it would be very helpful to everybody here if you would just stop and, and it, instead of, you know, of just saying, uh, we're under great stress here and distress, which is true, to begin to develop a vision of what it would look like if you really were able to cope well with the, with the crisis at hand. So let me give you uh, some examples of what comes to my mind. First of all, you would be able to regulate your emotional response. In other words, instead of being constantly consumed or controlled by your reactions to the ongoing crisis, you would learn how to breathe and to let go of those emotional uh, uh, impulses and those the, the tremendous drive inside of you and be able to access your what the uh, neurobiologists uh, call your front, prefrontal cortex so that you would be able to number two be able to think more rationally you could choose your response rather than just react out of a fight flight or freeze response third your relationship with god would nurture and sustain you and you would be able to see ways that you can put your faith into action. Fourth, you would not be emotionally swallowed, swallowed up by evil, negativity, and frustration. You would still find meaning, purpose, and value in your daily life. Five, you would be able to concentrate, create, do your work, and contribute to the well-being of others. And then six, you would be able to experience more peace and joy amid all that you cannot control and all that oppresses or burdens you. I share this with you because one of the most important things in coping with stress is to not let your emotions overwhelm you and to maintain a vision for what health and wholeness would look like, even if you feel like you're a long ways away from that. A vision gives you a direction to go. A vision helps you know how to pray. 
a vision suggests to you what kinds of resources you might need to help you to, to reach that vision. And so these six points are, are part of my vision for what it looks like for me and what I believe it would look like for you to be coping well with the current crisis. Now, tonight, we cannot possibly identify, let alone talk about all the possible strategies a traumatized person or nation might create in order to cope better with this current crisis. But we can focus on one major source of help, our faith and Christian spirituality. So let's turn now to Christian spirituality, why it's important and how it could help you cope better with the current crisis. To begin with, let's try to define what is spirituality and what is Christian spirituality. My definition that I've developed over the years is this. Spirituality refers to the nature and quality of our relationship with God, both how we know and experience God and how we live out our faith, hope, and love in every aspect of our life. Now, if you were, trying to, if you were to Google spirituality, you could easily find 100 different definitions of spirituality. But I'm naturally very influenced by uh, the New Testament and what I read in the New Testament about what spirituality means and how it's rooted in a, a real relationship with the Trinitarian God, God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But let me add a couple other dimensions here based on the work of other people. Sarah Sh Sandra Schneiders, a pioneer in the academic study of spirituality, captures well the, the interplay of belief, which is more cognitive, relationship to God, which is, which is more spiritual, and relationship to the rest of humanity, which is more social. When she defines spirituality as one's lived experience of faith. So considering tonight's topic, we can say spirituality will become most helpful to you in coping with the present crisis. The more your faith moves out of your head to become a lived experience. Honestly, I, I even noticed this for myself that I think in crisis, when we have a, a, a profound emotional response to, to trauma or to, to crisis in our lives, it's very easy to disconnect, for there to be a disconnect between what we say we believe or what we think we believe and how we're actually at responding in the world. And so spirituality, if it's properly understood and integrated into our, all of our being, brings our head and heart and life experience back together again. And this is so important to your ability to cope. Now, there's another individual named, uh, well, let me add this. For Christians, spirituality is more narrowly defined and offers additional resources. Any religious person can have a general type of spirituality that seeks connection with God. Uh, people all over the world of all different kinds of religion have some kind of relationship with God. I, I can't really speak for them because I'm not them. I'm not in their context. Um, but I'm talk, I can talk mostly about my Christian experience and being part of the Christian uh, tradition and religion. And so when we move from a, a generic definition of spirituality to a Christian definition of spirituality, we, we need to link our understanding of connecting with God to our relationships with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned a few moments ago. And to link our thinking and expectation to all the wonderful and helpful resources that come through those special relationships. The late Robert Weber, uh, author and seminary professor of ministry, defined Christian spirituality simply as a lived theology. As an Anglican, he was more uh, interested in emphasizing what God does for us 
apart from even how we know it or experience it. And so for him, spirituality is neither experientially based, something you feel or, or, or a vision you saw or, or something like that, nor is it dependent on our ability to adhere to a certain set of rules. Like we follow all the Baptist rules or we, or we follow the Ten Commandments. He says spirituality is not about either experience like that or about following rules. Rather, Christian spirituality is grounded in God and in what God has done on behalf of humanity through Christ and the Holy Spirit as it applies to each individual. And you see, and there's the link. The spiritual life then means embracing this theology by faith and living into the new life that comes through God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me pause on this, on this point for one more minute. I believe the contribution of Robert Weber is to emphasize that our spiritual life is dependent upon God. So in the midst of crisis, you and I are full of doubts where we have huge reactions, where some days we're afraid, other days we're discouraged. Some days we're, we're raging with fury and hatred. Other days we're just discouraged and depressed. But our spirituality is not dependent upon those shifting feelings, Robert Weber says. He says it's dependent upon God and what God has done for us and how God has called you to be his own. And all that God has done through Christ to make you his own. That's the rock solid foundation for your spirituality. What needs to be added to that then in lived experience or lived theology is for us to be, to have in mind our, that our foundation is secure and then to be listening and connected to the Holy Spirit and to Christ within us so that we may know how God is leading us and working through us. Now, we're not going to spend any more time on defining uh, spirituality or Christian spirituality tonight. The main point is that Christian spirituality offers tremendous resources to help you cope better with the current or any crisis. Because it's grounded in God. It's grounded in what God has done for you. And what God does, does for you still through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And what you can experience as you let the Holy Spirit teach you how to live out your faith in practical ways in every aspect of your life. And so now we're gonna turn our attention to three important coping strategies arising from Christian spirituality. One, lean heavily upon relevant spiritual truths, draw upon useful spiritual practices, and, and this is the correct number three, unlike the earlier screen, Take concrete steps toward greater peace and joy. Strategy number one, lean heavily upon relevant spiritual truths. As uh, many of you know, and I mentioned this when I, I talked about hope in a hopeless world to, to, uh, as a spiritual talk a couple of years ago. Uh, I published this book in 2020 in response to the COVID crisis. Um, but as time has gone on and as we are now dealing with new challenges and new crises in Myanmar, really all over the world, it's become uh, very evident to me that the spiritual truths in this book are very relevant to all situations where we're trying to, to cope with suffering and, and, and evil and oppression and injustice. And, all those other things that make life so very difficult for us. And while I don't think I use the word cope in this book, it was surely intended to help Christians to cope better. So I wanted to provide a biblically based, theologically sound foundation for trusting God in the midst of your crisis, while avoiding the two extremes of clinging to false hope of God's miraculous de deliverance on one hand, or abandoning one's faith in God altogether on the other. 
let me go through these seven spiritual truths, uh, just, just in cursory fashion. Number one, remember your limited ability to understand the will and ways of God. Take whatever God offers. I hope you will look up some of these scriptures later uh, when you have more time. Uh, but this spiritual truth is a reminder to stay humble. Sometimes when we rage at God or we, we make big statements about what God should do and, and, what, and why God is wrong to not do this or that, uh, the scripture reminds us that God's ways are not our ways. And they will, you will never reach peace if you continue to rage against God and think that you can understand everything that God does or doesn't do. Second, the second spiritual truth is to expect God to be at work in your life, leading and guiding you, and act accordingly. And of course, this is a very important spiritual truth that is helpful as a coping strategy. Because again, the contrast is to be so caught up in our emotional reactions that either we go to one of those two extremes I, I mentioned. One is just to cling to uh, false belief and false hope, or to be buried in depression or sadness or, or, or apathy and doubt. But scripture calls us to face our suffering and to look for God to be at work in our suffering. And one of the ways he is at work is to lead and guide us and to guide us together. When we seek discernment of God's will and we seek to work together, and so we should be expecting that even though we may not ever hear a voice from God or see a vision, that God is at work silently among us, leading and guiding us and helping us to make difficult decisions in the midst of very difficult situations. Spiritual truth number three. Expect God to strengthen your faith, build your character, and restore your hope. Through your suffering. If spiritual truth number two was about seeing God at work leading and guiding you in, in decision making, spiritual truth number three is about what God wants to do inside your own heart and mind. And again, as a coping strategy, this is extremely valuable and important because it means that I will not just look at the problems, I won't just feel sorry for myself. I won't just curse my enemies, but instead I will say, I can't do anything about these circumstances in, in many cases, but how is God, how could God use this adversity to make me a better man, to make you a better woman, to make, to make us a better body of Christ, a better church, a better school? Spiritual truth number four. Expect to share in the sufferings of Christ. Expect to share in his glory. Now, I find it very difficult to clearly identify how the suffering that's going on in Myanmar connects to the sufferings of Christ. But I think more broadly that the connection that I see, I've found so far, is that whenever we seek to do what is right or to stand up for what is right, whether we're advocating for ourselves or we're advocating for other people, we will suffer just as Christ suffered. And there's that social justice dimension to the spiritual faith. I wish we had much more time to talk about this in detail. And of course, there are more details in the book. Uh, but for now, I just want to say that, that Christians from the beginning of the, of the, the Christian era have learned to see in their suffering something of this call to share in the sufferings of Christ. And part of how they endured it was not only considering themselves privileged to be experiencing what their leader experienced, but also the hope and confidence that one day we'll share in his glory. That doesn't mean that we're going to be praised by God or praised by other people. I believe sharing in, in Christ's glory means that one day everyone will see that God really was at work in your life 
God really was, he really called you. He chose you. He loved you. He put faith in your heart and he gave you an ability to endure the suffering and to serve Christ's purposes. And that, that was, and, and looking back, they're going to say that was an amazing, beautiful, wonderful thing that it happened. And in that sense, we share in the glory of Christ. Spiritual truth number five. Remember, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Again, very important truth. Why is this one important? Because sometimes we just don't see any redeeming value in our suffering. Sometimes suffering is just suffering. Sometimes evil is just evil. And we are the victims of that. You are the victims of that. I can't create a beautiful picture of, of every evil thing that happens or, or maybe any evil thing that happens. Sometimes I can't even see any good that comes out of some evil. But that's why this spiritual truth was given to us by the Apostle Paul. Because he's saying even in the worst of circumstances, there is one thing that can give you more peace and confidence and even joy. And that is nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And what he's saying by that is someone may take away your freedom, your possessions, your home, and your loved ones. But they can never take away your God. They can never take away Jesus. They can never take away your eternal hope. This is indeed a precious spiritual truth. Number six, expect more peace as you put your anxieties into God's capable hands. Uh, there's a lot more detail, of course, in the book. Um, but one of the things that we find as a spiritual truth and a spiritual practice in, in the Bible is that something happens when we consciously make a connection to God with our concerns. We reach out to God. And in this passage of Philippians 4, Paul does not promise that God's going to give us what we ask for. But there's something about reaching out and making that connection. Where we pour out our heart to God. And we give him our concerns and we leave those concerns there. That results in what Paul calls the peace that surpasses understanding. Number seven, expect to be renewed as you accept your limitations and wait on God. In other words, an important spiritual truth or part of Christian spirituality is to believe that giving up or letting go of what we cannot control, letting go of our of situation that, that we're, we feel powerless in and acknowledging our powerlessness, but doing that in the context of prayer, in the context of Christian fellowship, in the context of faculty members, students, uh, church members getting together and sharing their stories, acknowledging the powerlessness in the context of faith and connection with God brings peace. And many times it brings joy. Why? Because we, we are freed from a burden that we can't carry on our own. And, when, and once we're freed, we begin to experience joy again. The conclusion is something I shared it, for those of you who are the, at, at that talk two years ago on Hope and Hopeless Times. But what I said then in, in the final chapter of the book is that in the end, trust is a choice. And considering today's topic, let me, let me make the connection clear. If every day you are debating whether or not you can trust God, if every day you're debating whether you want to continue to be a Christian, if every day you're debating whether uh, it's, it, God is going to do anything good for you, you're going to be a very unstable person. And you will never get enough data from your experience to prove that, yes, you should trust or no, you shouldn't trust. Because there's lots of data on both sides. And that's why the way past that, that impasse is to choose to trust. Choose to trust in a God that you've known all these years. And continue to put your hope in him. Not necessarily for uh, a miraculous deliverance, although I pray for that every day. 
but simply a trust that the seven spiritual truths I share with you are real and they are relevant to your life and that you're going to choose to live by them even in spite of so much in spite of so much uncertainty okay that's strategy number one uh, let's go now to strategy coping strategy number two the first one was of course about importance of of leaning heavily upon relevant spiritual truths you need to know them have them in your head so that 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 the holy spirit can bring them to your mind when you lose your way and you forget these truths but this second coping strategy is much more experiential and that's why i offer to you and it's as an experiential coping strategy which i'm calling draw upon useful spiritual practices you know our faith and faith tradition may provide stability and strength for us in many ways but as i've said before christian spirituality has always been about more than belief and tradition christian spirituality as we observed earlier is dynamic or supposed to be dynamic god's grace and gifts don't depend on our experience but they always flow into our experience through the holy spirit now, you know this already. What you might not be familiar with is the fact that your spiritual type makes a difference as to which spiritual practices might be most renewing, energizing, comforting, or simply helpful to you right now during this period of crisis. So let's talk about four different spiritual types. This is a spirituality wheel that depicts four different types of ways to relate to God. Uh, this wheel was cre created by Dr. Corinne Ware uh, based on a typology of, of, of others who, that was developed uh, uh, years ago. But I want you to look at this, these four types here as a way for you to reflect upon how you best relate to God. The truth is we're not all alike and as you can see that that some people i don't know can you see my arrow when i when i make it go around and around okay good so some some people know god through their heads and that's more of a speculative spirituality and that karen says will represent as number one a second type knows god is revealed this is the cataphatic spirituality. And down here is, is a heart, spirit, heart spirituality. It's much more feeling oriented and experientially oriented, relationally oriented. And these, the effect of spirituality is God is known through the heart. So, th so this is a continuum here from head to heart. And this is a continuum from God is revealed all the way over to God as mystery. And the four types are fit in this way. The third type is mystical spirituality. Mystical spirituality emphasizes that God is mystery and may or may not be very heart oriented, but is certainly not head oriented. So head, head spirituality would be the polar opposite of mystical spirituality. And so whereas the, those who know God through their head for these people, words are extremely important. For the mystics among us, those who know God uh, in, in, in more of a, uh, a way that uh, is more mysterious without words and without certainty, but it's more of a sense, uh, these people will not use words, will rarely use words. Words, in fact, get in the way of really knowing God. And then fourth, we have social action spirituality. These are the people that, for whom God might very well be a mystery, but what's not a mystery is the injustice in the world. What's not a, a mystery is how people are suffering. And so these people live out their spirituality by what they do, how they live their life. I created a, 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 another diagram to simplify what I took from Corinne Ware's work. 
And so here are the four types again. One, whoop, okay, go back. One, two, three, four. And I'm calling number one, thinking spirituality. And number two, feeling spirituality. Three, being spirituality. And four, doing. And you can see some examples of, of how a person of, of that type might try to seek to know God or relate to God or connect with God. This is very important to, to, to now go to this next step of detail because it may give you more insight as to why you choose or gravitate to the spiritual practices that you do. So thinking oriented people love reading and studying and discussing and writing. Many teachers are thinking oriented because they love to gather information and share with others. But also many Christians are feeling, what we call feeling oriented. And these are over generalizations, but it's a way to try to understand a different type or a different way of connecting to God. And for these people, when they feel closest to God, when they're singing or laughing, even crying, if, it's a, if they're moved by something powerful or by the love of God, and they're weeping tears of, of joy or, or, or appreciation. Or just table fellowship, sharing with one another and, and listening to stories or, or sharing testimonies or just enjoying one another. That's when they feel like they've really been with God. The doing people, well, I'll make you do the being next. The being people feel closest to God when they're out in nature probably all by themselves in solitude and perhaps silence. These people love contemplating and they might sit for a long time watching a sunset or they may just appreciate the cross that's in the church or on the table uh, by their Bible. Or maybe they just look out the window at the sky and the stars at night or the clouds during the day or the flowers in the field or the mountains. And, and that experience or those types of experiences make them feel more spiritually alive. For those who are doing oriented, they're going to feel more, most spiritually vital when they're serving or, or doing social action or, or advocating for justice. I hope it's obvious to you the value of identifying these four types. Because the more that you know what your type is, the more you should know where you can go if you're feeling spiritually drained. If you want to draw on your Christian spirituality to give you more strength to cope with the current crisis, and then go back and visit. What type of spiritual preference do you are you or, or do you have? And then spend time doing the kinds of things that pertain to that type. I am thinking or oriented, and that would be my first choice. But my second is doing. So as far as I'm concerned, it's very important for me to be reading and thinking and journaling and teaching as I'm doing tonight, because that makes me feel alive and strong and confident. And, and, and I feel like I have a lot more strength to be able to face the crisis when I'm doing those things. But I also need time doing things that feel like they're worthwhile, reaching out to those who are suffering. You know who they are. And, and I've written to you about some of the people I've been meeting, people who, who need encouragement, who need some support. And for me, spending time with them makes me feel more spiritually alive and more confident in the power of God's love in me and working through me and among us. And when I have that experience, uh, I can handle the crises much better. On my website, you can find these 50 spiritual practices, which I have divided up into these four categories. Uh, if you want, you certainly can take a screenshot of this now if you're interested. Um, but this might be very valuable to you uh, to just spend a little bit of time finding your primary category and going through these suggested spiritual practices. Maybe a very practical way for you to to re-energize your spiritual life. Maybe you've been doing traditional spiritual practices regularly and maybe you're tired or you feel like you need something more. Well, look at this list. 
see if the Holy Spirit doesn't bring out one or more of the items uh, that could help you in this journey of, of looking for resources from your Christian spirituality. Again, we don't have time to talk uh, about this very much more, um, but I, I offer it to you as a way of, of, of emphasizing the importance of drawing on helpful spiritual practices. But in order to do that, you have to identify where they are. And you have to insist upon taking time to do it. It's not a luxury. It's not an indulgence. It's a necessity for you. I'm going to guess that almost all of you took time to eat something today. Why? Because it's a necessity. I hope you all got sleep last night. Well, why? Because you had to. It was a necessity. Well, so are these spiritual practices. They're a necessity for you to be able to face the current crisis and to cope with it. Um, they're also valuable for many other reasons. But tonight, we're focusing mostly on coping and their, their value to help you be strong. Why are they so helpful? to tie this back to our definition of Christian spirituality before, because each spiritual practice has the potential of connecting you more vibrantly to God. And the number one answer in this entire presentation tonight is that God is the source of your spiritual strength. And so whatever you can do, whether it's intellectual, theological, spiritual practices, or some, in some other way, that anything you can do to help you connect to the source of your spiritual strength. That's what you should be doing every day. One of my uh, favorite spiritual practices, I'm, and I'm just going to highlight one here briefly, is something called stop, look, and listen. I share this with you. It's something you can do in five minutes, but it's, it's, it's particularly relevant when you're in the midst of a conflict you can't resolve, you're in the midst of a situation that seems overwhelming, you are stuck and you don't know what to think or where to go or what to do. Uh, there are many types of situations that you find yourself in where you know that you need some more resources, but you don't know where to get them. This spiritual practice is, is simply this. Step one, stop, means stop whatever you're doing. Stop trying to fix things. Stop trying to make yourself better. Stop trying to change somebody else. Stop everything you're doing. Take a few deep breaths. Try to regulate your emotions so that you're, you're not being driven by your emotions. And then move to step two. Look at what's going on around you. The Buddhists do it this way. And I know I'm talking about Christian spirituality tonight, but I want to give you a parallel here in their practice of meditation. What they do is they breathe, calm themselves down, which is what I mean by stop. And then they detach themselves from whatever attachment, emotional attachment they might have, a person might have to whatever's happening. Then they look through their third eye, which is what we would say is simply observing from a detached position. And by observing from a detached, emotionally detached position, a little distance, we suddenly can see things that we couldn't see before. So stop, look from a detached place, notice the other person, notice the situation, notice how you're responding, how you're acting, how you're reacting. Notice all those things. And then third, listen. And this is what, what differentiates the Christian from the, the Buddhist meditation practice. The Buddhist will, will listen to himself or herself. The Christians listen to the Holy Spirit. And we also listen to ourselves, I hope. But our prayer in our time of listening is asking God to help us to see what we need to see. To have courage to face the truth. And then to have wisdom and strength to act on whatever he reveals. If we had more time, we'd do it tonight. But I hope maybe you'll even try it before you go to bed tonight. Stop, look, and listen 
related to something that's been particularly difficult for you. But for now, uh, in our remaining time, we're going to just look at coping strategy number three. Take concrete steps to greater peace and joy. Some of you know that uh, in September, I posted uh, four successive, on four successive weeks, I, I posted four articles on Facebook and on my blog site um, about four steps toward greater peace and joy or to experience greater peace and joy. And these four steps have been very helpful to me. Whenever I felt heartbroken, frustrated, disappointed, sorry for myself, or any number of other negative emotions due to some unwanted change or circumstance or even person in my life. These steps now are simple to see, but they may actually take a long time because they, they include grieving losses. And sometimes grieving losses take uh, months and months, sometimes years. But let me give you these four steps here because they are They've been proven very helpful to me and I know to other people in helping us get unstuck mentally and emotionally in a wide variety of difficult situations. The four steps are simply these. See, accept, appreciate, and delight. Step number one, see. See is just exactly what I, I talked about a, a couple minutes ago when I talked about stop and look. So it's the same thing. It's just now in a different package. Uh, it's so important that you and I learn to see what is real, what is true about our circumstances. Denial feels better because it shields us from the pain, but denial does not help us get better because it keeps us trapped in the illusion and fantasy. Step one in, in coping with unwanted change or coping better with unwanted change and coping with crisis is to find the courage to see the truth about whatever you need to see the truth about. Here are some questions for you to think about. What do you think you might be blind to? Maybe it's the truth about a conflict you're in or something about your life here. Or this, I did this for the refugee people or about the situation in Burma. Maybe it's about your relationship with God or about how you're thinking or living your life or something else. What is your blindness costing you? How would your life be better if your eyes were open to the truth? Step two, accept. You know what accept means? Accept means not approving, not seeing the bright side, Accept is simply saying, I can't change the situation. What's done is done. Or this person is who he is or who she is, and I can't do anything about it. Or what they took from me, I can't get back. Acceptance is seeing the truth and saying, this is the way it is. And then letting go of that rage, that resentment, that bitterness, uh, that hatred or whatever emotional reaction you've been attached to or that has been attached to you, letting that go and saying, it's done. And so here the explanation is maybe you see clearly, but you haven't been willing or able to accept your situation. If that's the case, you are probably continually upset and stuck in your negative emotions. However, you don't need to stay stuck is what I'm saying. And there's nothing you can do to change your situation or to get back what you lost. Accept the truth and move on. What do you need to accept better today? Step three. Once your eyes have been opened and you've accepted your unwanted situation, then you're ready for step three, appreciate. Ask God to give you eyes to see the good that is in your life. 
appreciate the opportunities that are available to you to learn, to grow, to contribute, to serve, or just love and, and be loved. When I recommend appreciation here, I'm not saying that you appreciate that you lost something or you appreciated the evil. That's not what I'm saying. Appreciate on step th for step three can only come after you've accepted what you've lost as lost. And now you turn your eyes to something else. And you start to notice the beauty, the love, the other things that are still good in your life and the opportunities that are still available to you or that may still emerge in the days ahead. Finally, step four is delight. Now, step four uh, takes appreciation to the next level. It even goes beyond just appreciating to actually taking pleasure in, in various things in your life. Where you can find uh, where you where can you find something to delight in in your life? What people or ideas or healthy activities bring you a lot of pleasure and joy? Good friends, family, an interesting book, being creative, being out in nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Apostle Paul says, "Think about whatever is good, beautiful, pure, or praiseworthy." Above all. The psalmist says, to delight in the Lord, first and foremost. And that focus will cure a lot of blindness and give you more meaning and direction for your life. Well, I'm racing through these, and there's a lot more detail uh, on Facebook, but also even more detail on, on my blog site. But this gives you an idea. But I'm trying to give you some ideas about some concrete steps you can take to help you as you're trying to cope better with your current crisis. In taking these four steps to greater peace and joy, I'm not suggesting you should live in denial or cling to false hope, not at all. I'm suggesting just the opposite. The whole restorative process begins by finding, the, as I've been saying, the courage to see what's real and to face what you would rather not face. Then the next step is to accept what you cannot change. You stop holding on to the negative emotional reaction that's been holding you prisoner for a long time. Then you will be more ready to take the next step. Appreciating your blessings and the opportunity is not clinging to false hope, but embracing the gifts. I realize I have it here. Uh, appreciating your blessings and opportunities is not clinging to false hope, but embracing the gifts that are truly yours to enjoy and to make the most of. Then finally, delight is all about putting your life in order and rediscovering the joy that is available to you. Delighting in God's creation and the lovely things and people of this world, and there are many, and delighting in the Lord Jesus Christ are not escaping reality. They are choosing to focus on your relationship with God and all that God gives to you and all that we have like on this call tonight all that we have in our relationships with one another in the body of Christ. And these, these great gifts, and God through these great gifts, are our great source of peace and joy. Tonight we've talked about, as you know, our topic is coping with the current crisis through, Christ, through Christian spirituality. And we talked about the impact of the current crisis and what coping might mean and looks for you. We define the value and role of Christian spirituality in times of crisis. And then we spend most of our time looking at three important coping strategies. I suggested that you will find greater peace, joy, and strength if you do the three things daily. Lean heavily upon relevant spiritual truths. Utilize the most helpful spiritual practices or draw upon useful spiritual practices. And three, actively work through your grief, which I reworded to be take concrete steps toward greater peace and joy. For additional resources and explanations of what I talked about tonight, please see our resource library where there are resources in English 
and in Burmese and uh, even in some of the other ethnic minority languages. Uh, my blog site contains all of my essays, including the, the ones I mentioned tonight. And you can subscribe to that so that you're always notified whenever I publish another one. My YouTube channel, Tim Jeffrey, and if you haven't seen that, is full of, of many, many different recordings from the New Testament theology class, all the lectures with Burmese subtitles, uh, to many other talks and, and messages that I've been able to give on, by video. Facebook, if you're not a Facebook friend of mine, uh, I would like you to be a Facebook friend of mine. So I hope that you will, uh, you will friend me and uh, especially if you will send me a message and let me know that you were on this call tonight. Uh, that, that would mean a lot to me. And that way you, you will see whenever I uh, post in English and in Burmese. And my wife's website is full of resources related to labyrinth prayer. And finally, my uh, personal email. Uh, please feel free to write to me if you want to share with me anything related to what you experienced tonight or a question about uh, drawing on Christian spirituality for coping or, or if you just want to make a connection. Do it on Facebook or, or do it by email. Thank you for listening so carefully and well. And now it's time for our question and answer period.